Hey everybody, Jordan here. The PH is silent. I almost forgot that as I was saying that. I say that so much and I was just like, what do I what do I say after that? That's weird. Um, thank you guys for checking out the Saturday Morning D&D show. Uh, in this episode, we talk about uh, campaign settings. Um, campaign settings in the past, campaign settings that they are hinting at in the future. It's going to be really exciting. And Sir Lucian is live from Game Hole Con. So he comes in on his phone and we uh, add, just talk about Game Hole Con and all the stuff that's happening there. It's really exciting stuff. So thank you guys for checking it out. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Saturday Morning D&D Show. My name is Jordan with a silent PH in the middle. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Sir Lucian, over there at Sir Lucian Gaming, live from Gamehole Con. So it's going to be a little noisy because he's in kind of a noisy area. So bear with us. But Lucian, yeah. say hello, sir. Hello, everybody in the morning. So it's good everybody's here for the morning show. And I got to make it. Hopefully this works out. We're in a wireless environment here. And we'll see. But I'm right in Podcast Alley here where all the other people are doing their podcasts. So we're in good company here in this spot. That's awesome. So tell us about GameholeCon. What's going on there? Boy, it's like every time you walk anywhere, you bump into somebody you know from some, some type of community that you like. I've got uh, all of the Wizards of the Coast people were here. So I got one of my books signed, which was super cool. I bumped into Chris Perkins as we walked in. And all these other people, uh, like Matt Lillard's here, and Pat Cobain, and then Kate Welch, and all these people. And then the WebDM guys were over right here. They have a booth set up because they're doing their podcast stuff, and they're recording all their cool things, like interviews with game designers and stuff. So I've seen a little bit of that. And then uh, it's a pretty good convention. It's small enough that you can walk around it within probably five to ten minutes and find stuff. But it's cool. It's got that really kind of home-like vibe to it where it's easy to find stuff. And just, you know, jump in a game somewhere, whether it's a board game or an RPG and, and play. I'm going to go over to the Adventure League room because it's a huge room for Adventure League. And I'm going to do some brand new Adventure League character stuff today for sure. That sounds awesome. What are you doing? Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> so I, I acquired um, this really kind of nifty book called Art and Arcana. Oh. Uh, came in the mail a couple of days ago and I've been reading through this and this book is really cool. If you're interested in the history of the Dungeons and Dragons, I would highly recommend picking it up. Um, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Like just kind of reading about it. I uh, got to the part of like the fall of TSR and Wizards of the Coast taking over and then Hasbro buying Wizards of the Coast and like what happened with the D&D brand as all of that kind of like went down is really interesting. So mm -hmm. Um, and so that's kind of what and I've been doing. the artwork in that is fantastic. Yeah, the artwork. Well, yeah. I mean, it's all this really old, awesome D&D artwork that they collected. Yeah. There's the, they have a picture of the original Tomb of Horrors uh, drawn by Gary oh, Gygax, yeah. like his pencil drawing of the original tomb. Um, and it's just like really cool to see how this all kind of like stuff of legend and how all this stuff kind of came to fruition and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the stuff that brought us into the hobby anyways, was that stuff that you saw on the book cover or mm -hmm. sitting on the on the shelf somewhere, uh, the D&D &D cartoon art or whatever it was. That's the thing that drew you into saying, hey, I should find out what this is. And so that's the thing. That's the first thing you see from it. So it's really cool. Yeah, it's yeah. really awesome. Um, in D and D news, uh, Ravnica's out. Have you picked up your copy picked, of Ravnica? I did. In, well, my my game company set one aside for me. I got the message last night about it, and then I was walking through the the, the hall here, and they had it, and they were doing the full Wizards of the Coast signing. So I went and bought a, one. Had the full Wizards team sign it. So Chris Perkins, Jeremy Crawford, uh, Mike Merle. Uh, Chris Lindsay, Kate Welch, all of them signed my book. So I got that one. So now I'm probably going to have two because I told my game store I wanted one too. To put one <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But yeah, and, and I was reading it last night and the artwork's fantastic. It's a solid book from the first read I've done so far of it. And it's really cool about how to build the guilds, use a big city type adventure that's way different than the water deep type adventure. Because we were talking about in our previous shows that you know, this has kind of felt like the year of the city modules. We've mm -hmm. had three big ones here at the end of the year with Eberron launching because they have their Sharn. We have Waterdeep, obviously. And then this one, Ravnica is an entire city that is, uh, or an entire planet that's a city. So three big 
different versions. And you wouldn't think that a city adventure would be different. You would think, well, it doesn't matter what big city you're doing. It's all going to be the same. But that's not really true. Each one of these are so different and, and you could play them differently and still have fun and not really kind of overlap when the other ones. So it's, it's a really cool book so far. New character classes or subclasses, I thought, or yeah, there were two of them. The, the Spore Druid, which you liked, that was in there. Yeah. And the, the Domain Cleric was in there. And then the races, they got the Minotaur, and they've got the uh, the Centaur is in there. Um, Loxodon, the Elephant cool People. Worlds. Loxodon, yep. The Delkin, I think, was one of them. Simic. So all kinds of cool stuff to add to your to your adventure. And I'm going to. I'm going to add it to my Revenar campaign, because I think that's going to be really cool to add some of those things. Um, is it, would you call it a campaign setting? Like, cause yes. people, yeah. So it's just straight up. This yeah. is a campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons, you know, separate from Forgotten Realms, from Dark Sun, from all those others. It's like, this is our, if you want to play in the world of Magic the Gathering, pick up this book. Yeah. They kind of mentioned that and they don't really talk about that. I've seen, I'm still kind of going through and skimming through the different areas. I don't recall seeing a spot where it said, okay, this is where this world fits in the multiverse, or this is how, like, it's some other continent of Forgotten Realms. They don't mention anything like that. They just talk about, you know, this is one of the most popular Magics of the Gathering uh, settings. Mm -hmm. And so in those settings, um, they said this is the one they wanted to pick to, to do their release. And they just talk about it from the Magic the Gathering point of view. And nothing is brought over as far as, like, mechanics. From magic the gathering it's all just inspirational so it's just if they had a character or a monster or something because there's a lot of cool uh monsters in the back of it too so it's a it's a campaign book it's a character creation book it's a guild creation book it's a city creation book it's a here's some more monsters to throw in your your campaigns it's got everything npcs the lore of ravnica so it's a really yeah. good in-depth book so far. Definitely for the home brewer, probably really good resources to just like add the little things, much like yeah. what you're doing with Ra uh, Ravnik, not Ravnica, um, Revenar. Revenar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too many R's. Well, one, yeah, one cool thing I thought in there that you're going to really like when you see it is some of the monsters they introduce, they have some randomness to it. So they say like you can have the... Maybe, I'm, I don't remember the name of it, but maybe it's called something like the Simic Berserker, and it has a, a stat block, but it also has a section right in the stat block that says, roll 1d2, and this Simic Berserker has a hammer hand, or roll 3 through 4, and this Simic can fly or glide, or well, so there's like this randomness to the actual character that, uh, or the actual NPC that you're building or using in your campaign, which I thought was really cool. I haven't seen that in like, the, you don't see that ever in like Monster Manual or mm -hmm. um, anything like that. So it's kind of neat to see some randomness to it too. So I thought that was pretty fun. That is really and cool. Artwork's great. And yeah, and you're not, you're not considered a planeswalker. Like the type of characters you're making, you are no. the cards. Like you're the grunt that's yeah. like fighting for a planeswalker yeah. or something. Well, you're, you're a D and D character yeah. wholesale. You're, a, you, they're not talking about you like, yeah, like, like you're any part of that. And you can be guildless or you can be part of a guild. They talk about how to, how you would bring together characters that are of different guilds or how you should form your parties. Like they have this random, a lot of random generation tables too. So if you just want to really random it out and they can say, how do you form your party? Are they all from the same guild? Are they from different guilds? Um, are they just, are you going to choose one or two guilds that work together and have an alliance and only pick classes that are normally uh, associated with that? And then it also puts the little blurb in that says something like, you don't have to follow these rules to the letter, but they're just guidelines to say like clerics are usually in this guild or mm -hmm. you know fighters or barbarians tend to be in this guild or something like that so you can play it really to the to the way they have it set up or their randomness or you can just kind of bypass that and say well my character you know is is a paladin but they're definitely going to be in this guild for whatever reason and you can do guildless which you kind of you're almost a mercenary in that way for the guilds so that's really cool it's very interesting yeah, I want to do a whole video on it. I meant to do it. I didn't realize it was coming out this week on the 9th. I thought just Dungeon of the Mad Mage was coming out on the 9th. I didn't realize Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica was. Well, and I always have the so 20th in my I, mindset. Yeah, I always have the yeah. 20th in my mindset because that's when it's released everywhere. I forget about the uh, early release for the the game stores and what have you, so... But um, yeah. it's available on D&D &D Beyond. I think it's available on Roll20. So all of those digital platforms, you can grab it and start looking at it now. 
So, yeah. Um, and then yeah. in yeah. other well, news, you, did oh, you go get ahead. Your Dungeon of the Red, the Mad Mage. No, did I haven't picked up Mad Mage. Mad Mage. I don't have Waterdeep, and so I didn't pick up Mad Mage either. But it's, uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll drive down to my local game store uh, <laughs> today or tomorrow and see if they have it. Um, because again, like level 20 content is really awesome, and it seems like a really good dungeon to steal ideas from. So, yeah, the um, other thing I saw on the shelves here. Yeah. where they're selling map packs that I hadn't seen before. So they're like map packs either for the Dungeon of the Mad Mage or Guildmasters of Ravnica. So they're like a separate supplement that has a bunch of maps and stuff in it, and char- I think pre-gen characters or something. Like paper a maps? Separate or... pack. Yeah, like, okay. like, a, yeah, so like, like a map that I, you I would lay down like on your table? Like or something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. So they were. I didn't see what the price was on them, but they're right next to the books. And we haven't seen that yet either for no. what they're releasing. I haven't seen anything like that. So. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, all this talk of campaign settings and Ravnica and what have you got us. Uh, there is a not a rumor, but so Nathan Stewart of Wizards of the Coast announced on Twitch that they're going to create a new campaign setting for 2019. And it's got all these people being speculated about uh, what kind of a campaign setting they're going to release, whether that's going to be um, something that they have already done, like Dark Sun or, well, they've already done Eberron, but like Dark Sun or or Spelljammer or something like that, or if it's going to be completely new. Although he did say, um, we're not doing Spelljammer anytime soon, so don't go there. But what campaign setting are you looking forward to? Or do you think this is just going to be more Magic the Gathering tie-ins campaign settings for 2019? No, I think it's going to be one of the ones that's already done. And I wonder if he keeps saying no Spelljammer and he's lying. Because I could could (laughs) see Nathan keep saying, like, hey, it's not going to be Spelljammer, but it actually is this whole time. but if it's not that, I mean, the one I want is Greyhawk, but I feel like maybe they go back to something like um, Planescape or, I mean, they can't be Eberron, right? Because they've already released that. They can't consider the actual release of the book for Eberron to be their big announcement. Like, that would be a pretty big letdown, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that would be fairly large so <laughs> and yeah. i don't know if they're planning on releasing like a hardback book of eberron at some point but uh since they've already eberron's already out there like i think eberron is isn't done but i think it's it's out there you can acquire it they're not they're not overthinking eberron at this point where it's like okay we dangled the carrot now they'll get the real meal in a little bit so well, I guess it could be Dragonlance, too, because we've been seeing a lot of new artwork coming back. We've been seeing a lot of um, celebrities that they got into D&D from Dragonlance and the books. And so I've been seeing a lot more of that. So maybe that's the idea, is that maybe next year we hear Dragonlance gets to come back for the first time. And the D&D movie that's coming out eventually, um, they're working on the script right now, Joe Mag- Magnanello. I always forget how to I say his last name. name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he's working on it with a bunch of people, and it is going to be a Dragonlance novel that they adapt into a movie from what okay. I've heard. Uh, that's the rumor, at least. So maybe if that's, that's the case, go. maybe the, they want to tie it in, like, movie with an actual product and things like that. I could see Wizards of the Coast wanting to do something like that. So, Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see. And we won't know till next year because they've just been teasing it. I asked Kate when I was in line and she was signing my book to spoil it, but she wouldn't do it. So I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this was really interesting from my Art and Arcana book. Uh, I wanted to read about, there's a, on page 270, they talk about campaign crazy and they say TSR continue to break new ground with the release of birthright campaign setting, which lets players uh, command the armies of nations. But if you keep reading, um, it says it, 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 the, the, the new campaign setting of Birthright uh, was part of the increasingly multifaceted Dungeons & Dragons landscape, but it was necessary to distinguish each setting with an artistic aesthetic um, that, you know, so you knew Spelljammer stuff from Eberron stuff. You knew, well, not Eberron at the time, but you knew Birthright stuff from Spelljammer stuff from pa- Forgotten Realms stuff. Um, yeah. And the visual identity of the Dungeons & Dragons brand was growing inconsistent. 
um, there were all these different campaign settings, and they all had a different style, and it's caused the 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 brand of Dungeons and Dragons. People didn't really know what that was, because to some people, Dungeons and Dragons was Dark Suns, and to some people, it was the Forgotten Realms, and to other people, it was just this playground for them to create their homebrew world. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk about that because mm-hmm. with fifth edition, they learned their lessons from TSR and they, and they even learned their lessons from, from, I think, uh, fourth edition where they created Eberron or not fourth edition, third edition where they created Eberron and other things that they were like, well, we want to solidify the D and D brand with an adventure setting. And so for fifth editions, that is the forgotten realms and the forgotten realms I think has become yeah. quite popular because it's the default setting for dungeons and dragons. Um, and people are getting that co- not confused, but they're it's like Kleenex and tissue. You know, they're they're associating the brand with the product. Um, what with this new Ravnica and Magic the Gathering kind of campaign setting come out? Uh, do you and the, announcing that they're going to do another campaign setting in the future? Is this something that is going to happen to Wizards of the Coast again? Do you think are they going to? I don't know fracture too much or is it going to uh because i i noticed the ravnica art was very similar to art we've seen in the past from dungeons and dragons they didn't try to or maybe yeah, i'm wrong you have the book point out. no 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 but even the covers and even the way they did the layout of the book it's consistent with all of the other books so it feels like because they have consistency in art and presentation and right. format that it might not have the problem that they had before. They must have had different art teams, different art directors, and people just had a different idea of what they wanted their books to be. Um, you know, maybe more gritty, maybe more, mm-hmm. I don't even know what their differences would have been. Maybe they were just different departments in TSR or, a, you know, original Wizards of the Coast. But I think now they have such a strong, iconic, you know, their fonts are the same. The colors of all the books and the covers and the way it presents is all the same. I don't think you're going to walk by a shelf and see, you know, you, you won't mistake Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica as another game, like as it's not D&D. Because yeah. it fits right in there with all the other D&D game books. It just looks, it just matches up on the shelf just like it. So, no, maybe they avoid that this time by keeping a really good tight grip on... Um, just the art style, probably. I think that's a huge thing the because you would look at a you yeah. would look at a, a wall and you would see, oh, Al Kadim. What's Al Kadim? It's you know, in, yeah. in, in very small print above Al Kadim, it says Dunge- Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and then Al Kadim. Yeah. And so people would be like, I don't really know what this is. Um, also, the uh, Art and Arcana book said that there were different licenses for each of those different um, properties. So if you wanted to make a video game set in the Forgotten Realms, you had to go to the other and they. You had to go to the Forgotten Realms department, or if you wanted to do a Spelljammer or a Planescape, you had to go to the Planescape department. And if you wanted to write an adventure, you had to go yeah. here. And they kind of just like they they stretched themselves too thin, as opposed to being like one kind of conglomerate. And it wasn't until Wizards of the Coast came in with like a whole bunch of millions of dollars to basically buy TSR and save all of those properties and put them under one umbrella company that can do whatever they want. And then they were very particular, like we're gonna we're gonna you know, dip into dark sun here. We're going to do this, but there's, there's other campaign settings like the hollow earth campaign setting that have never come back. They're just kind of not right. supported. And that was just an AD and D thing. They were like, it's not worth us bringing that back at this point. Uh, yeah. And I don't know. I, I didn't realize that there were so many like going through this book. I'm like, there were a lot of campaign settings. So makes me ask the question, do you have a favorite? Or do yeah, you? Greyhawk has always been my favorite. Really? Yeah. Okay. Greyhawk for some reason, I think it's because of the first one I was in. One of the first big modules that I remember buying and playing in was Temple of Elemental Evil back in the day. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that just kind of sticks with me this time. So it's nostalgia for me. It's that one. It's that that gray, gritty Gary Gygax, uh, Greyhawk campaign. Yeah, that's the one I love. That's the one I hope they bring back. But, you know, uh, Matt Colville was always saying he loves the Birthright one. So his favorite campaign was Birthright. So maybe that's one of the ones that we're going to see coming back around where it's a lot more larger army um, and that might tie into some of their other you know, other assets that they have, too, for games and, and stuff. It would be interesting to see because they have so much prior backlog, like you said, you just noticed in that book that they can go to, that even Nathan said that they're not going to do a brand new one that's never been done before because they have such a big backlog of all of these other campaign settings they could go to and use. 
No, that's what I actually, that's the opposite of what I think that they were doing. Cause he did say like, this will be a new campaign setting. And I know you were saying like, I don't think that they're going to do something brand new, but I, I was like, it kind of sounded like they were because it's like, he's like, we're going to do yeah, something I, brand I new for 2019. Mean, now, does that mean brand new as in we've reimagined dark sun or is that brand new as in it's a brand new campaign? There you setting? Go. We're going to have a photo bomb of Jim coming by on the Saturday morning show. Here he is. Hey, he's going Jim. By. Hey. <laughs> This is the web deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're up, we're across from his booth over there. They've been watching me hold the camera up this whole time. They're probably laughing at me because I'm holding my arm up and it's getting tired. Yeah. Well, we don't have to do <laughs> a full a show. Guy. You're probably getting pretty exhausted. So. <laughs> no, that's good. No, it's, if we can make it, we can do it. Um, so I think it's good. And I think, um, I think it's exciting because we get all of this stuff. And just imagine like, we're super excited about kids on bike and we're, we're super excited about tales from the loops and all these new games that are coming out. And yet D and D, which you would think is maybe, Oh, maybe it's growing stale or something. It's not We're still super excited about all the stuff that keeps coming out. They keep yeah. adding more stuff that keeps the hype level up. It keeps the excitement level up. And we haven't said, you know what? It's too much. Or we haven't said, ah, eh, I don't really want that book right now. I keep everything they bring out. I keep saying, I want it. I want to get into it. I want to do it. So yeah, they're no. on a roll right now. It's really good. as well. Yeah. It's interesting. Really. I, I <laughs> will see where it goes, but the campaign yeah. setting talk, I just find really interesting because they're, they're kind of, we've been waiting for this, you know, and they, they, mm -hmm. they put it out there a little bit with Eberron and now they're putting it out there with this Ravnica book and, and we'll see mm -hmm. what 2019 hits. But I wonder if 2019 is going to be the year of campaign settings and they'll release like a mega book. That's like, here's dark sun and birthright and all these others. And Hugh can play in these worlds because, you know, rather than releasing little books, but I feel like they'd make more money if they release individual books. So who knows what their plan is. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy because if we look at the number of books they've released this year, it's got to be double than the previous two or three years. Like in the two or three years, they've released maybe three or four books in a given year. But this year, it feels like it's doubled that. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. And then Dungeon of the Mad Mage is out as well. Uh, we kind of touched on that briefly, but uh, you're excited to run that uh, as it, you're buying that on Roll20 because you're going to run it on Roll20? I do, but I want to try to play in it first. If I can do that, so I don't spoil myself, then I'm going to buy it on Roll20 so that after I played it and I feel good about it, then I want to go back and run it for people. Cool. I want to run that big mega dungeon experience. You I want to stream it, or are you going to just run it, run it? Yeah. I, yeah, I'll stream it all. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I'll stream it. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, yeah. What are your plans for the rest of GameholeCon? Well, I'm going to go over and I'm going to make a brand new uh, Adventure League character. So that's one of the things I wanted to do so I can have one that I can take around to the, the conventions that I go to. So I'm going to build a brand new one. And it's like at 1 o'clock or something the time here, I'm going to play in the uh, D-O-L-0-8-1 or something. like the very first adventure for Season 8 uh, Adventure League. I'm going to go see how that is. I've never played at a convention Adventure League. So we'll see how that goes. And then after that, um, at some point we're going to go out to dinner with the web DM guys tonight. We're going to hang out with them Sweet. and that's going to be cool. And then we're going to, I'm going to come back and see if I can get in another game of some sort. I'm also going to a lot of, um, the vendors that are showing off their games. A lot of these indie people that have their own role-playing games. I'm a sucker. Like I just bought another, um, I just bought another superhero game, role-playing game from a group that, you know, I was just like, I've never heard of them. Um, it was like green monkey press or something like that. Yeah, and I'm just yeah. like, I'm going to buy your book. I just, I'm just like, I'm just going to do it. And so I'm, I'm going to keep going through and looking for more people like that. Maybe try to find a board game to jump into here or there. Um, really do it up and then head home tomorrow morning at some point. Get back home. Cool. Is GameholeCon primarily uh, tabletop RPGs or is it just tabletop games in general? Um, it seems mostly RPGs. There are some board game rooms here. Like right over here, the off camera, they have a nice big painting setup. So there's a bunch of people painting miniatures in this big area. This is like podcast alley where I'm at now. And then they have a steel battalion thing set up where it's like a computer game, but it's got like controls and pedals and you play as a team. It's all networked together and that's over in another hall. But it's it's a super miniature version of Gen Con for sure as far as the rooms. Like it's like, it's not even the size of like that one big room that me and you walk through mm. um, where all the vendors were. Everything here would fit into that like three or four times. It's much, much smaller. And that's fun. <laughs> and you're in uh, Wisconsin, right? 
Yep, yep, Madison. Madison, okay. Wisconsin. Sweet. That sounds awesome. Cool. Uh, did you play any games that you want to talk about? Funny that I did. I did. It was funny because even though I'm super busy, even though I went to work um, up here and did uh, our user conference where I go and I teach software to people, Monday night before I left, I, we did our uh, Seeking Revenor game. So we did play. And they are still fighting their way through the top level of this black step pyramid. And they just keep freaking out and they're sending me all kinds of stuff, but they're loving it. And it was full on combat. The whole session was like a full combat. They didn't even get through it. And um, it's this old module that was written by Gary Gygax. And it has all this stuff about, here's what you do for reinforcements when they come. Here's the forces that are there. Here's the group that will go down and bring more people up if, if they're getting attacked up at the front. So if you just kind of just barrel in like most groups do it's funny because all these reinforcements come up and stop you from going any further so you have to find a way that that person doesn't go down and bring more reinforcements and my group hasn't figured that out yet they just hit their heads against the wall about four times they fight up at the top and they get pushed off and have to go back to town to regroup so it's been pretty funny i don't know how they're going to get further down if they don't figure out a way to stop the guy who goes and gets reinforcements yeah so that'll be interesting but so we played that um, we were going to play on Tuesday, but again, no groups were able to get together. We had three players, but we couldn't get to the four, which is my threshold. Um, this coming up week, I got to drive to Pennsylvania. So there's only going to be the game on Monday night. Um, and that's about it. But aren't you in like a, you're in, um, a charity stream today, aren't you? Aren't I am. You doing, I am. Um, extra life, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm doing extra life today at, uh, 7 PM Eastern time, uh, Oh, Ted over at Nerd Immersion is doing a 24-hour thing, and God bless him, he's DMing for 24 straight hours. And I'm just like, I don't know how he's yeah. going to stay awake, but uh, I'm playing a Yuanti Ranger that's got a pet snake named Taipan, and uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be really fun. So apparently, it's called Homebrew, and we're in a coffee shop in Waterdeep. Uh, called okay. the coffee shop is called Homebrew, and it's and like where the employees at this coffee shop is the entire premise of this 24-hour stream. So if you want to catch that, um, I'll definitely uh, put some links at the end of. Well, just search nerd nerd immersion on Twitch, and you'll find us there. But that's at 7 p.m. Or follow me on Twitter, and I'll tweet out when I'm on there. But um, that's gonna yeah, be really fun. I love so the that's nerd today. immersion channel. So good. Yeah, Ted's just yeah. a great guy. So. Yeah. Really awesome. Well, Indoor Adventure is also doing his 24-hour he stream. Is. He started last night, and I was I was up messing with them, and he had started their game, and I saw him a little bit this morning playing band battles, and then they said the uh, they were going to play a Ravnica game after that. So they're doing theirs. Everybody's doing theirs this weekend. There's lots of live games happening even here for the same charity. Like, everybody's doing it, and it's great. Cause yeah. raising a ton I of saw money. the Dungeon Bastard, I think he's called, uh, of yeah. Saving saving Throw. Is that it? Um, and yeah. Amy Vorpal and them, they were doing a charity yeah. event today at Game Hole Con, so that's yeah. really cool. Um, yeah, and it's just I fun. I might sit in on that one. I might go in and sit. Yeah, you should. That, that was all really I awesome. did. <laughs> did you get any of your campaigns done this week? Yeah, let me let me look at my notes. Uh, I did play uh, my Warforged character. Um, we were kind of exploring like an ice temple. And remember last okay. last week I was talking about how I was just rolling awful and not doing any damage and not able to utilize my character how he was kind of like utilized uh this was the complete opposite yeah. i was rolling all kinds of ridiculous hits and i took the dueling <laughs> feat so i have a plus seven to damage so every time i hit i at least do seven damage and when i would roll really high because i have two attacks at level five when i would land all of these attacks like i'd add them all up and i'm like all right i just did 25 points of damage and everyone's jaws kind of hit the table like yeah i didn't know a fighter could do that and i'm like well yeah there you like when you when yeah, i kind of spec my good. guy for combat and i'm <laughs> able to do combat well I, he performs yeah. well so it was a it was a cool ice temple and we did a lot of puzzles there was some interesting combat there was a really fun um sled that we got into and we had to like roll to to basically maneuver this sled and and avoid obstacles or hit hit things and take damage uh and just i like i like dungeon scenarios like that where you get to yeah. play something stupid basically <laughs> like like we're we're D, &D <laughs> adventurers we're like you know high fighters we're taking over the world uh but we're gonna go on a sledding trip and we and you can use the D, &D mechanics to make that fun and interesting so um 
One right, thing that was right. really cool, though, is he utilized terrain a lot. Uh, there were ice sculptures, so there was, like, half cover behind certain things of ice, um, difficult terrain, or, like, we'd have to roll agility checks on the ice to see if we fall prone. And it got me thinking about um, just terrain in general. Now, I draw the map, and I kind of – I'll put trees and stuff, but I really leave it up to my players to be like, can I hide behind that, or is there a chandelier? And usually I'm like, well, yes, you. there's a chandelier, and yes, you can hide behind that. I'll give you cover and things like that. But I don't meticulously build a battlefield. And uh, mm. Nathan, my DM, really did meticulously build this battlefield, and it was really interesting and fun. So from a Roll20 perspective – how often do you utilize terrain to like either favor the monster or favor the player, or do you just kind of throw maps at your players? Well, I like to build the maps, and that's a really good point because in this um, uh, this last game on Monday night, my team had were at the top of the pyramid, and when they come in the front doorway, on either side, the creatures that live there um, had stacked up all the supplies, so crates and barrels and everything. So they were using that as cover, but they got pushed out of there and they got pushed down some stairs. So then my players said, well, we want to put all these crates and barrels at the top of the stairs so those things can't come back up. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. And I started moving the items on the map because they were tokens. Yeah. And I moved them to the stairs and they all, their jaws dropped with the idea that, wait, I just moved all the crates and all the barrels where they wanted them. And they were like, this is so cool because they were able to stack all this stuff up uh -huh. that showed up on the map. And it was real and then moved it to where they wanted it. And they were just, they were blown away. <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, I, lo I love to throw stuff in there that they can use for cover, partial cover, full cover, or elevation rise and stuff. Things to keep away from that might be dangerous. Uh, difficult terrain so that it takes more movement to get through. Lots of those kinds of things. They've been fighting over a barricade and jumping back and forth. And my players are real tactical, so they're always looking for those little advantages to, like, break line of sight so they can't be hit. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, they, they love to be able to step out, make their shot, and step back away. So they're, they always want me to keep that kind of stuff in the game for them. So, yeah, I think my group is that way. It's, so it's cool that you're kind of getting to see a little bit of that. Yeah, it just kind of made they're me very... feel like I'm, I'm lacking as a dungeon master. I was like, oh, <laughs> I never really thought about, like, I've utilized terrain, but I, I haven't really utilized yeah. terrain. And now I want to... I right. want to buy, like, is it Dwarven Forge that makes all of the cool 3D terrain stuff? Oh, yeah. Once you start buying Dwarven Forge, you're in trouble because you yeah, won't stop, true. and it'll get <laughs> insane. <laughs> but the idea of, like, yeah. building a really cool battlefield and then and, – and I guess you would save this for kind of, like, the final battle. But, like, having, having pockets of lava or having, like – uh, uh, just fiery cauldrons or something that you could like push players in or players could push monsters into or, you know, utilizing yeah. the battlefield like that. Like my uh, Warforged uh, Eldritch Knight has the lightning lure cantrip. And I did that specifically so I could pull monsters away from, cause it, you can pull something 10 feet. And I got that cantrip so that I could pull okay. monsters away from uh other players that are being attacked and kind of manipulate the battlefield like that. So it's, it's been kind of fun that the, that my DM is also encouraging that aspect of the game. Um, with, yeah, you know, with all the, the my player used the, uh, that same combination. He threw down spiked growth, I think is what it was called. Yeah. So that if you move through five inches of the square, you take 2d4 damage. And then he was using that same whip like thing to pull people 10 feet through it. That's awesome. So he would throw it down and then use the whip to pull people through it. So yeah, that's definitely kind of the stuff you're doing. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, yeah. And then I played my, I, I was sick the previous weekend. So uh, during Halloween, so we couldn't finish our Halloween episode of hot Springs Island. So this ah. week I finished my Halloween episode of hot Springs Island. My players just kind of said, we'll just have like a, a late Halloween. And I was like, all right. Um, Basically, they fought some undead, they fought the creature from the Black Lagoon, and they fought a giant pumpkin. Uh, now, what was interesting is the progression that they did this. Um, they fought the undead, and my and I forget which undead, I, Death Wisp or something from Tome of Beasts, but when he attacks, the damage that he does takes from your hit point maximum. So our ranger went from about 60-something HP to 30-something HP because I, I did a bunch of damage to him, and it lowered his hit point maximum. Not really thinking, like, well, you know, he'll get it back on a long rest. Like, it's not a big deal. 
But then when they were fighting the creature from the Black Lagoon, which was another monster from Tome of Beasts, it was some undersea, I don't know, Cthulhu-esque creature. Yeah. Uh, I cast Chain Lightning, and I straight up did 60 damage to our ranger. And because his hit point maximum was lowered, he insta-died. And I've never had that happen before. Like, it really blew me away. I was like, wait, you're dead? He's like, yeah, if, if you do the math, like, I took double my hit points in damage, I'm dead. And I was like, oh, man. So I had a backup plan if somebody had died and it was that they came back as a ghost because it's a Halloween episode. And so I handed him the statistics of a ghost and and he loved it. It was really funny. I didn't I couldn't tell if he was going to be angry or not that his character died. Right. But he was like, I got to be a ghost now. Do I just level up as a ghost? Meanwhile, his party (laughs) members are trying to decide if they should like how to raise him. And they're like, we got to get 300 gold so that we can cast the resurrection spell. And he's like, don't worry about it, guys. I'll just level up as a ghost from now on. I just want to be a ghost. (laughs) I'm a a CR4 ghost. Like I'm pretty, I'm pretty badass. Yeah. Uh, and it just cracked yeah. me up. So he played the rest of the adventure as a ghost. And then this culminated in what was causing all of the Halloween shenanigans was this magical pumpkin that was spreading a curse over all of the land and, and causing children to transform into werewolves and causing the fish of the sea to turn into creatures of the Black Lagoon and the undead to rise and stuff. So they fought against this giant ah, pumpkin, cool. which has, um, I think it was a shambling mound that I just, the shambling mound eats creatures, engulfs them. And instead, I just had him like pick people up and eat them because I like the idea of this giant jack o' lantern pumpkin eating creatures. Um, so that was yeah. really fun, and and yeah. they they were able to you know win and best my creature. And then, uh, but it got me thinking about holiday games as well. Um, have you ran? Do you run Hall- Halloween games? Do you run holiday games? I haven't yet. I haven't done any themes where I match up what's going on in the campaign into there's a holiday going on, but I've played in a bunch of, like, I, for whatever reason, I get invited to a lot of them. So I play a lot of these, like, uh, the Headless Horseman episodes during that time, um, or, like you said, like a Halloween version where everybody's a ghost or something. Yeah. Um, I haven't quite done it yet. We did a Christmas one where we had to save a Christmas town from evil Christmas goblin elves or whatever they were. It was really funny. So I do see a lot of DMs do it, and I haven't done it yet, but I'm sure I, eventually I will. I just haven't yet. Halloween seems to start the season for themed games, yeah. you know? Like, you're going to do a Halloween game, yeah. and then you're like, well, I might as well do, like, a Christmas game. And, and if you're really creative, you can do a Thanksgiving game and fight, like, zombie turkeys or something. Like, that sounds really exciting. So Yeah. Um, I don't know. I cool. was... Uh, and it also this experience kind of opened my eyes to players playing monsters more and how that would be really fun to kind of like right. you're, you know, you're polymorphed into a bunch of like pixies for this campaign. And so everybody gets pixie sheets and they have to like run around and be pixies or, or you're a dragon. Or you're I this. Like a yeah. Like, yeah, like I like the I idea like of them being polymorphed into something and having an entire campaign where they have to play monsters. Like that seems really yeah. fun and interesting to me. So. I like, you should do that idea. That's a good one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, I want to play in that. that uh, yeah. Well, I'll have to write something and then I'll, I'll figure it out on roll 20 and we'll play or we'll, we'll do it live at a con or something. Hey. That would be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Now is your module up on um, the DMs killed now? It isn't. Um, I am doing one more play test and I've got it out oh, okay. to one other person who is doing a play test as well. And I wanted okay. that feedback before I finish it and put it on the DMs guild. Um, but I will right, tell cool. you, I started working on another project that I'm really oh. excited for. Okay. I wanted to be able to randomly roll a magic item. Like if I take five or six different kinds of dice, I roll them and then I'm like, I have a sword that shoots fire that's name is Henry and you have to like magically attune and it hates ogres or something. And so mm-hmm. I've been working on a spreadsheet of all these different tables that I eventually want to culminate into some kind of a flow chart on how to roll a magical item. Okay. Um, so that's like kind of this. my next that's in it. This will, this will be maybe six months or a year when I finish it, who knows, because I just don't have as much time as I think I do. <laughs> but, uh, I really like that idea of being able to roll a magical item. And so we'll see, we'll see what yeah. happens from it. But yeah, so that's my next, uh, as I'm getting feedback from my one shot, I want to publish that. And then I think the next thing I'm going to try and publish is uh, a magical item kind of generator. So 
could be that really cool. That would be cool. I like that. I've seen one in, I'm using it in Revenar. It came from the original D&D module written by Bruce Cordell, which was the, um, it's a version of like running Diablo okay. 3 or Diablo 2 in your game. And they wanted to have that same loot drop mechanic where it had this really random um, magic item stuff dropping with, yeah. the, you know, like this is the sword of the bear and that means certain things. And this is the sword of the eagle mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. You might look into that and just take a look at how, see how they did a little bit of it. Um, yeah, they did huge charts and huge, like you roll this and then you roll this and then you roll this. Yeah. It's like a huge thing. So this sounds cool though, because I think players love customized weapons, not just the ones that they read about in the DMG. I think they love it when they get, like you said, this is the, you know, this is the, the sword of fire. This is the sword of, you know, the yeah, Western give it a cool hemisphere name. or something or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting because looking on the DMs guild and other resources online, like lots of people make, uh, they make magic items for sale. Like, Hey, I made, 20 magic items buy them and they're like magic items like in the dms the dms guide uh oh, the dungeon yeah. master's guide and so i'm kind of like well what if you wanted to be inspired by this like like you could go through and pick the yeah. ones that you want or you could just roll randomly and create some kind of cool armor that casts invisible when it's wet you know something yeah. just interesting like that that the players can utilize so i've been talking with a lot of my players in like what do you look for in magic items and i've been incorporating that into a lot of my um in a lot of my charts and it just kind of i find it interesting because a lot of my players aren't saying i like this sword that does a whole bunch of damage they say i like the quirkiness of this magic item like i just said right. like armor that turns invisible when it's wet like they like weird little curious things like that you know <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, I think all players do too because it's just something unique and it feels different than just a generic here's your ring of plus two protection. Oh yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah. Or your yeah, plus yeah. one sword of damage or something like that. It's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. it's really cool to be like, well no, it it has a weird thing that if you you have to like whisper nicely to it and it has to roll a charisma save and then the magic happens, you know, and stuff like that. So right. it's just kind of right. interesting, but Cool. Well, yeah. we'll look forward to seeing that. Yeah. Well, Will that be on uh, DMs Guild, or are you going to do that one on Drive Through RPG? I don't know. Uh, it kind of depends how much of the Wizards of the Coast stuff that I use. So uh, if I use too gotcha. much of it, I think it has to be on DMs Guild. If I make it ambiguous enough, I could put it on Drive Through RPG. Um, so we'll see. Could yeah, that's fun. cool. That should be fun. Yeah. Not to just sit here and talk. I mean, that's cool that I talked about like, hey, I'm working on this, but I literally just started, so it's not going to happen for like a long, long time. But yeah. oh, okay, yeah, we'll put the. It's not coming out next week. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, maybe cool. we should let you get back to Gamehole Con. Yeah, it's time to do some gaming. That time sounds awesome. We're going to end our episode just a little early because Lucian's arm's getting tired and he's got a convention to go to. <laughs> but I want to say thank you guys so much for uh, coming out to the Saturday Morning D&D Show. Thank you guys for watching us live. And we will see you all in the next week because Lucian will be home, right? And so we'll have a regular episode yeah. of the Saturday Morning D&D Show. Yeah, yeah, I'll be home. I'm driving home Friday, so I will be home Saturday. Okay, sounds great. Well, thank right, you guys so guys. much. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.